Hello and welcome to today's wide briefing, Identity and Our Digitised Future. I'm Natasha Banal, the Business Editor at Wired UK. In today's briefing, we'll be exploring digital identity and what the roadmap for global adoption looks like. Almost a billion people lack a recognised form of ID and as a result can be denied access to basic rights such as financial services, healthcare or social services. A surge in demand for online identity verification during the pandemic and the return of global travel has accelerated the demand and development of digital identities. I am delighted to be joined today by RJ Bala to talk about this subject. RJ is president of Cyber and Intelligence for MasterCard. His team develops solutions that make consumers, merchants, partners and governments around the world a lot safer. RJ, welcome. It's great to have you with us today. Good to see you, Natasha. Thank you Hello. for having me here. <laughs> no problem. Lovely to have you too. Uh, just a note for everyone who is watching, we will also be taking questions from our audience today. So if you'd like to ask RJ anything, please use the Q&A function on your screens at any point, and we will try to answer as many of your questions as possible during the session. So RJ, let's just jump right in. Uh, proving that we are who we say we are is one of the biggest challenges that anyone has in life, whether you're buying a car, uh, traveling through a border, opening a bank account, uh, th there's that big hurdle uh, that is the proof of identity. And this barrier has left out, as I mentioned, billions of people who don't have a recognized form of identity on them at the time, or they don't have one at all. So as our lives have veered dramatically towards online services in the last 19, 20 months or so, how do you think the pandemic has accelerated the adoption and development of digital ID? So Natasha, when we talk about digital identity, I like to talk about trust because really that's what it boils down to. When you are doing any, anything in your life, any transaction, banking transaction, or, or any other service that you are you know using you have to have trust with the other party from whom you're buying services and that uh, works in the physical world that works in the digital world that's how we've gone about in our lives now the digital world you really can't see who's on the other side so it becomes even more complicated and the need for trust becomes even higher and that's exactly what happened during the last 18, 19 months during COVID. Uh, everything went digital. You know, all our lives went digital from buying groceries to, you know, doing Zoom calls for work. Everything was digital. And here you need to establish that trust because you don't really know who's on the other side. And that's where the importance of digital identity comes in to prove that, that trust. Uh, we saw in the last few months, uh, I guess last almost year, uh, our numbers were that MasterCard did about $900 billion in additional volume. Yeah. So that tells you, uh, that number was for last year. That tells you the, the number of transactions went up and that went up because we had technology and solutions which were able to establish that trust to prove your identity online and which which facilitate the move of our lives to completely digital. The other piece uh, is that it also uh, grants access to everything you want to want to do in terms of transactions. Uh, so, you know, um, millions of transactions are happening as we speak and all these transactions need to prove who you are. Uh, and frankly, if these solutions are not very good, then you, you, I'm sure you've experienced, you can get a lot of friction. Uh, you can have delayed transactions, you have to do the transactions again, or one of the things which you were buying, an airline ticket, you know, it's gone because you took longer uh, than expected. So it's very, very important. And then finally, I'd say uh, the other big uh, reason why digital identity is of real importance is it helps uh, save organizations from fraud. It helps consumers save from fraud. Uh, there is uh, massive fraud in, in the world when you do digital transactions and organizations face almost $43 billion uh, in global identity fraud losses in 2020. And uh, all this 
can go away and our lives can be smoother, easier, simpler, and we can have a good experience if we have good digital identity. On the face of it, people might think that giving more information is going to make them more vulnerable to fraud. Um, how, how can that data be kept safe? How, how is it that, that you're able to be safer by using digital identity versus other kinds of technology? So with digital identity, we believe you should be the owner of the data and there should be no trade-off between convenience and security. You know, we've, we've had experience and a history of handling payments which need securing your, your data. We've done that for decades. And uh, the way we've crafted this entire digital identity technology is that the user creates their digital identity through what we call a trust provider. It could be like your bank, it could be like your academic institution. Uh, you could have a pre-existing trusted relationship with one of these institutions. You then use your biometrics. It could be your facial recognition, it could be your fingerprint biometrics, and the organization then helps you create the digital identity on your device mm -hmm. uh, using our technology. And once this digital identity is created and stored securely on the user's device, that data is shared by the user when they want to. So one of the reasons, uh, you know, we looked at it, I'll give an example, you know, even to prove an age to someone, okay. you know, you, you end up showing, sharing all kinds of documents. Your, you know, where you live, your address, and many of those details you may not want to share. So using this kind of technology, you actually uh, get the user to share the data they want to share, and the data is shared on their device, and, you know, they have the choice of sharing the data with whomsoever they like. Yeah, and that's that's one of the things that I thought um, you've said or you've said for a long time, you know, it makes no sense if you're buying, you know, a bottle of wine that someone should know where you live. It makes no yeah. sense that, you know, if you're trying to pass a border that anyone should know anything they don't necessarily need to know ab about you. Um, I wonder, though, because there's a lot of different countries, different companies, uh, different organizations that are approaching digital ID in very uh, disparate ways. I wonder in terms of the frictionless side of things that you were talking about. What are the kind of things that would need to happen to create a unified, global, frictionless digital ID system so that there are no problems um, and people aren't asking for different kinds of information depending on, on who you're dealing with? Yeah. So I think having standards on what you are creating and how it's created, working with partners who believe in your philosophy mm -hmm. and having the right technology. I think all of these three things go together in helping create an ecosystem where your digital identity can work seamlessly and with, with good experience. Uh, take the example of a COVID-19 test or a health pass. Mm -hmm. You know, you've been reading news, you know, all countries have been trying to do it. Various health organizations have been trying to do it and it's proven to be complicated because they use paper certificates. Some countries have gone digital but then there is no interoperability because you can have a digital certificate on your device, but if there is no one who can read that device or accept that, then it defeats the whole purpose, right? Yeah. And creating a blueprint, which actually helps create those standards, which helps create that entire interoperability, which helps create acceptance, that's what's going to go uh, a long way. So to that extent, for example, for COVID, we joined with ID2020, uh, and are leading with working with the organizations in technology, health and travel to launch a good health pass. Uh, same principles. And that's exactly the principles we are using in developing our own digital identity where we are working with several partners uh, who are working with us in developing standards and look, looking at interoperability. Mm -hmm. What, what do you think constitutes good digital ID? I mean, you mentioned privacy, you mentioned people being empowered to use their own data and make sure they still hold their data. Um, are there any examples out there that, that you would point to as, as good digital identity users? So I would say, you know, one of the big things we have been very particular about is that it's very easy to create a solution, but especially when you talk about identity, your data and how it is stored, where it is kept is extremely critical. 
so our model embodies privacy by design where the user is in control of their data and identity information which is not stored in any one location which can be vulnerable to attack mm -hmm. um, and and the very fact that you because you own your own data it makes sure that you are controlling the data and because the data is on your device you know it, it is it is uh, uh, secure and we've got numerous projects running globally uh, to help governments and private organizations launch digital identity for citizens and consumers we are also working in several collaborative groups uh, and in various industries because we are not only looking at financial services as a use case we are looking at healthcare we are looking at education uh, which are again many of the in industries which really need a, a robust solution for digital identity yeah and that kind of leads me to my next question which is what happens next right we were talking about digital inclusion and about the amount of people that don't have access to id about them kind of having the doors open thanks to digital id um what do you think the next steps are how can digital identity drive inclusion in the future so i think you said that in your introduction um, <laughs> and that there are almost a billion people in the world who have no access to an identity document mm -hmm. and that creates a bigger problem uh, for them because that means they really cannot have, get access to financial services because the minute you can't prove your identity no one will allow you to open a bank account uh, and that's been the biggest issue so we've been working uh, with several institutions around the world in looking at standards and processes where we could create identity for uh, you know this population uh, as you know we, we shared this with uh, you before mastercard has helped 500 million people in you know in the last few years to get financially included we are now focused on extending our commitment and taking it to a billion people uh, who will have access to financial services and the digital economy by by 2025 and we believe digital identity is the is the core to solving this and we are looking at a number of solutions uh, you know we have a solution which is a, called a community pass which is a suite of digital tools which connects people simply and securely to vital services through a safe data platform we also have an inclusive identity platform which is a biometric based authentication ecosystem so we are looking at a number of technologies again working with a number of institutions because you know institution can uh, do this alone you need to work in partnership with a number of organizations around the world and we are making progress so thinking about the the long term play of digital id i mean you, we're looking at change that's not just you know in the day to day but also fundamental changes in our society we could see you know current digital business models replaced by something else we could see the systems that we're used to engaging with as citizens as human beings as consumers completely transformed and the power that consumers have will, will be very different right so what do you what do you think will happen i mean you've got a lot of data at play here a lot of people being engaged a billion potential new people coming into the fore how do you think digital id is going to play out in the coming years if you look at the future everything we do is moving to to digital and uh, you know with the newer technologies of artificial intelligence and 5g and all these newer technologies the way we interact with digital devices and the way data can move through these devices is going to change dramatically and what that means is potentially billions of these devices will get connected to each to each other and will actually do transactions for you so you can visualize a world of a self driving car which is paying you know for road access as it's driving through or buying you know fuel you know fuel may be a wrong thing charging batteries at that time <laughs> so i think it's a, it's a very very different world and uh this world will be facilitated by a lot of new technologies because while it all sounds very exciting it also means it's going to come with a lot of problems in terms of identifying you and making sure that these transactions are being done by your devices and not someone else's uh, so we have been uh, engaged in building capabilities uh, 
acquiring companies have these which have these technologies which can actually help create this this future uh, so you know new data one of the companies uh, which we uh, acquired some time back as a technology which looks at how you use your device and can can very quickly identify how you hold your device how you use the device and that that means we can quickly identify that it's actually you who are doing the transaction Similarly, all the artificial intelligence technologies that we are using, uh, these algorithms can look at the transactions that you've done, where you are doing, and look at all those transactions. But now these transactions could be coming from your devices, yeah. right? Which may be doing these transactions completely on their own. It's, it's a lot of um, margin for error, right? If this technology... Um... Failed. I mean, I, I wonder because there's it's difficult to talk about anything sort of future um, privacy slash security without talking about quantum computing. Uh, what what are your thoughts? I know that I know you've got your sort of your eyes set on the future, and I know you're very prepared for this. What what challenge do you think a quantum will will provide for digital identity, if at all? And and how are you preparing for that? So there is a lot of research going on quantum. There is a lot of tests going on quantum. And in labs, they have proven that quantum can work. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's there is still time. But, you know, with security, to create solutions that can handle a problem also need time. Because you can't just create a new solution and then have terminals and cards replaced overnight around the world. So we've been working on this and uh, we've developed capabilities for it. And we launched a quantum resistant contactless uh, card and contact uh, and uh, a device as well, which is mm -hmm. quantum resistant. Uh, so the world has incredible encryption capabilities today. That's why we are safe. But uh, this is about thinking about the future. This is about looking at algorithms and encryption that are actually going to protect us, even if quantum was to to be here. And, uh, you know, I, I think with the technologies that we are developing, it's it's going to be a, a safer world, irrespective of all these newer technologies coming in. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, definitely a challenge. I think that you're, you're very much up for it. It's, it's very interesting sort of how you speak about the future because that there's, there's a lot that's going to go on and this is sort of the ultimate test, right? For someone in your position saying, can my, can my systems withstand the future? And you seem quite confident, which is nice to hear. <laughs> We've got quite a number of questions from our audience, RJ. So I'm going to read some of them out, if that's all right. Okay, um, sure. They're, they're very, they're quite good, <laughs> to be honest. So I'm quite excited about them. So but there's one question about sovereignty, which we touched upon a little bit before. Um, this question from Sarah, who says, how can we reap the benefits of digital identity while countering digital authoritarianism or digital surveillance from malintentioned states or other actors. So obviously not talking necessarily about um, a lot of, of democracies out there, but what, what's the, what is the, the danger, I suppose, or how can, how can those people benefit without having their data gathered in a, in a bad way? So look, you know, digital identity is designed to make your life simpler, more efficient, safer. And uh, I think from a regime perspective, I think the, the way the whole solution is designed, the data is in your device. Now, if there are technologies which these regimes allow to, to collect anything that you do, I think no technology <laughs> will be able to help with that. But I think that the technology is designed that you can actually lead a very independent life, do digital interactions, verify your identity and keep your data safe. Mm -hmm. There's another question that's kind of linked to that, uh, which is about self-sovereign identity. Ash, uh, Akshay sorry, asks, what are your thoughts on self-sovereign identity? Do you think there is potential for this type of identification versus centralized model? I mean, we talked about one global frictionless digital ID system. Do you think there's potential for something completely different? Yeah, so, you know, there have been discussions in, you know, in think tanks, there has been discussion in academia, we've had discussions with several governments on this, and there are benefits of a centralized system, but there are also several shortfalls in a, in a 
centralized system. Because when you keep a centralized system, you're controlling uh, centralized data, you're creating honeypots, you are attracting attention of hackers, and that becomes the central point of attack for everything. And a decentralized system uh, is designed to make sure that nobody can get access to everything at one time. Uh, so they can get a part, but that part cannot be used because you know you apply technology, so no one can get get your complete information. Uh, the the conversation about having one single digital identity globally. Well, you you can have a Mastercard right now, which is one Mastercard, and you can actually use it globally. So you know, having an identity which you can actually use globally which can be accepted for digital services, digital purposes, purposes digital interaction is plausible. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we've been thinking of. And in fact, uh, what we've been working on is with several governments around the world to actually create interoperability as well. So if a particular country has done it, then we can work on a way that that identity can work with uh, identity solutions of another country. But then again, the whole idea of standards comes in because for interoperability to work, you have to be trusting, you know, one countries with another's. And that's where we come in, where we are helping design the entire ecosystem, which can work like that. Mm -hmm. You talk about trust. This, it's beautiful the way you're leading me from one question to the next. But, um, but there's, there's a, a, an attendee who asks, when you say your work in digital identity is built around trust, what kind of examples do you have of this trust? I can imagine one is, you know, talking to different governments and getting them to collaborate together, right? So I think I would even say, I would, I would put it into two parts. I think the first part is going by about your daily life. When you go about your daily life, you need to do transactions. You need to prove who you are. And we've been investing in capabilities and technologies to make sure that you can do that without friction. So we invested in a company called uh, Ekata and is actually a wholly owned company of ours. We acquired it uh, earlier this year and uh, it gives us access to 2 billion identities and has got this unique identity graphing technology which can identify who you are. So when you are accessing anything or you are applying for a new account or accessing a service, it can help us assisting the merchant from whom you're buying the service in making sure that they, they can identify that actually it's you doing the transaction. Then the entire device technology of new data, which I explained earlier, can identify very quickly that you are doing the transaction is from your device. And then thirdly, our account services where how you do, uh, you know, use your account, how do you go about your daily lives? And I, I think I shared that example with you, Natasha, before can actually tell us, uh, give us insights on how your account works. Mm -hmm. And then again, there are many technologies. So by interlocking and using all these technologies, we can quickly identify and help you with what you, what you do. And then we are using these technologies uh, with the various governments and assisting them with all the identification solutions they are working on. So as you use government services, again, these technologies can be used for your government services. And I suppose that the, the last question is about that engagement with different services and, and different products. Uh, Preeti asks, how, how will we have any semblance of anonymity where needed? So you've got a lot of systems, as you were saying, potential AI looking at your transactions, uh, governments looking through documents, um, you're verifying your identity a lot. Um, I, I suppose, is there a danger that there's going to be a creep where you are verifying your identity a lot more than you would have and your anonymity is lost? So the idea of this is to keep you safe. Mm -hmm. The idea of, of the entire trust in relationship is when I'm doing a transaction with you, you know, anybody could be making a video. I have to be able to know this is your device. This is you doing the transaction. And as as these newer technologies are coming in, it is a scary, scary world. I mean, you see the amount of hacks and yeah. the breaches and the, the news is, is every day. So you need technologies which can actually make sure that that trust in digital interaction remains and stays on with for future technologies. How we do it is very important. And that's why I shared the, you know, 
the data principles that we use, the digital identity principles that we use to make sure that these transactions and these interactions are done with those principles and with your consent. Mm -hmm. I think that's the critical piece that whatever is done is to make sure that you are safe and is with your consent. So in a particular case, let's say you decide that you are uncomfortable with a particular transactions or you do not want to share uh, information for a particular transaction, in which case you can, you know, do the transaction without that. Now, yeah. you may have a little more friction in that transaction, but, but you may choose that. Exactly. There's the option to not be frictionless <laughs> and not yes. engage. That's and really the idea helpful. is to keep you safe, the idea is, and, and that's why governments work with us very, very closely, mm -hmm. because for the digital world, it, it has to be without friction. Otherwise, you know, nobody will use digital technologies. I mean, the very fact that you and I can have this trans, this uh, entire interaction, which is being zoomed around the world, yeah. happening seamlessly, it's it's quite remarkable. We didn't have those technologies before. And yes, we can say these technologies also come with a lot of problems, but you can put solutions and technologies which make sure that they are done safely. Yeah. Yeah, more importantly, it's very difficult to see us going back to the way things were before. If you see what I mean, it's sort of, it's, it's difficult to, once you start using technology to think of a time when you couldn't use that technology and, and go back to, to, you know, analog and those kinds of things, because it's just like, well, it's so, it's so easy now. It's so, it's so frictionless. I imagine a lot of that similar kind of thing will be happening with digital identity. We'll get used to it and then it will be like it was always here, right? Yep. <laughs> All right, brilliant. Well, I think this is about enough time that we have, uh, unfortunately, for questions. Thank you so much, RJ, again, for your time today and for sharing your insights. Um, to all of those watching, if you enjoyed this session, please do check out other episodes of Wired Briefings at wired.co.uk. I wanted to say a thank you, final thank you to RJ and to everyone watching the session today. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, stay well, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, Natasha. Good to see you. Thank you.